We'd like to welcome you to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin for tonight's Bible study. We are ready for Exodus chapter 7 tonight. So if you want to find a Bible and be turning with me to Exodus chapter 7, we'll be there in just a moment. We're glad that you've joined us tonight. If you have any questions or concerns about tonight's class, if there's anything we can be praying about, if there's any way for us to help you in some way, we want to invite you to reach out to us. Uh, send me an email at info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can visit the website, find the contact information on there, fourlakeschurch.org. You can send a text or make a phone call to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you in that way as well. You can find us on social media by searching for Four Lakes Church. And we also want to invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not yet done that and turn on notifications so you could be uh, reminded or notified whenever we go live or add something to that channel. But tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So God's people are enslaved in Egypt, but God has chosen Moses as a prophet to lead his people to freedom. Uh, Moses is extremely reluctant, to say the least. We went through five or six of those challenges or excuses that Moses had for not following God's plan. Uh, but finally, Moses gets on board. He's ultimately willing to serve in that way. And so he returns to Egypt at the age of 80 years old, and he appears before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and it does not go well from the very beginning. In fact, not only does Pharaoh refuse to let the people go, but he actually makes life even more difficult by forcing them not only to make the bricks as they were doing previously, but now he forces them to go get the straw for those bricks as well. And the text tells us that they have to travel throughout the land of Egypt to do that. So it is an absolutely massive project, and they are overburdened with the labor involved in that, and there is no relief in sight. Well, in last week's study of Exodus chapter 6, God has Moses remind the people that he has seen their suffering. He knows what they're going through. And he's planning on bringing them out and giving them the land that he had promised to their forefathers. However, uh, the people are so discouraged by the circumstances that they refuse to listen. Uh, it's, there's too much. We have to deal with this whole brick thing, and we just can't be thinking about getting released at this point. And so now Moses is the man in the middle, isn't he? On one hand, uh, God has given him this impossible mission, which he never really wanted. And then on the other hand, the people that he's been sent to rescue really do not want to be rescued. And so Moses is uh, stuck right there in the middle. So that brings us to Exodus chapter 7. So Exodus chapter 7 tonight, let's jump back into it tonight with Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So Moses and Aaron did it as the Lord commanded them, thus they did. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Well, knowing that this is a tense situation all the round, to say the least, God communicates to Moses yet again and he gives him some reassurance. And so he gives this kind of overview as to what's about to happen because God can see what's coming. And so he lets Moses in on this. And here Moses is obviously pretty nervous. He's been commanded to go back to one of the most powerful leaders in world history. And as I just mentioned by way of review a few moments ago, it did not go well the first time. In fact, it made life even worse for God's people. And so God explains that he'll make Moses as God to Pharaoh. And I'm thinking that that would probably be pretty encouraging. God is saying that he would make Moses appear almost as deity in Pharaoh's eyes. Not literally deity, but he would make them uh, have that kind of authority over the king. And so Moses then is given power over the most powerful man in the world at this point. And to head off any more objections, notice God reminds Moses that he's been given Aaron as a prophet. If you remember, Moses didn't think of himself as a good public speaker, 
And so a few chapters ago, God gave him um, Aaron as a spokesperson. And here Aaron is described as Moses' prophet. So in this picture, in this analogy, if Moses is God, then Aaron is Moses' prophet. And so Aaron then will take on some of that burden of speaking to Pharaoh, actually uh, getting the words out there. So this isn't just on Moses. He's not in this all alone, but Moses will have some help with this. And that's comforting. Uh, to be given this huge responsibility, but also to know that you'll be working together with somebody. And especially, I think, if that somebody is your own brother. So there is some familiarity there. And I think at verse 3, this might have been the first reference to God hardening Pharaoh's heart, if I remember that correctly. There are a number of references like that scattered throughout these chapters here. Uh, but previously, if I remember correctly, God said that Pharaoh would harden his own heart. Uh, but now we have one of several references to God doing the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Not quite at this moment, but he says that this will happen in the future. So there's no contradiction here. This isn't a matter of God uh, overriding Pharaoh's personal autonomy. Uh, one of the commentaries <laughs> made the uh, suggestion or painted the picture of God sticking his finger in Pharaoh's brain and stirring it around a little bit, kind of uh, mixing it up and forcing him to do something that he was unwilling to do. Uh, that is not what's going on here. There is no contradiction here. Uh, God is not making this decision for him. Uh, but instead, Pharaoh makes the decision that he's not going to obey God. He's not going to do what God wants him to do. He's not going to let the people go no matter what. So this is a decision that he has already made at this point. And my understanding of this is that God will simply make it more obvious. And God will uh, press it to the point where something actually happens. Uh, a few weeks ago, we compared it to a, a husband and wife. And, um, you know, if she repeats her request for her husband to do something often enough, some men might get to the point where they dig in and they will never do the thing that she wants to have done. And again, not a perfect illustration there, but I think it kind of illustrates the fact that uh, sometimes um, if we push something with somebody, uh, somebody um, they might have made the decision not to do it. But if we keep on, keep on, keep on at it, um, they're going to harden their hearts. And in a sense, we're doing the hardening. Uh, a few weeks ago, I think one of our members uh, shared a meme, something to the effect of, uh, never in the history of calming down has anybody ever calmed down by being told to calm down. And I think some of you understand what that is. If we tell somebody to calm down in the middle of it, uh, that doesn't always have the intended effect, does it? So I think most of us have uh, learned through experience not to go in that direction. Uh, but in a sense, uh, Pharaoh has already chosen to go in a certain direction. And God is simply um, pushing him further in that direction to make it obvious to the others. So again, a lot of imperfect illustrations here. Uh, but ultimately, this is Pharaoh's choice to make. And uh, God, after that choice has been made, is kind of uh, helping him along in this regard. And he's going to get to the point where he actually forces God's people to leave the nation. So that's kind of uh, where we're heading over the next several weeks. And God is going to use this to teach some valuable lessons, uh, not only to the Israelites, but also to the Egyptian people. And um, notice uh, one of those lessons in verse 5, God will use Pharaoh's stubborn refusal to obey to demonstrate God's power, and in fact, to demonstrate this and to impress this upon the Egyptian people. So when this is over, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, God says. So we are heading toward a huge showdown here. And of course, if Pharaoh had simply said, sure, you can leave, well, the Egyptian people would never have learned anything from this. They, wouldn't have even, they would not have even known about this. So God is using uh, Pharaoh's stubborn disobedience to perhaps reach out to the uh, Egyptian people. Well, in verse 6, Moses and Aaron obey. And now we have a little note that uh, gives us some insight on the timeline. Uh, down in verse 7, we find that Moses is 80 years old at this point, and his brother Aaron is 83. And I know I mentioned a few weeks ago, and I mentioned it already tonight by way of review, that Moses is around the age of 80 when he's called by God through the burning bush. And that wasn't in the text previously. This is where we actually learn this. So uh, we kind of we can take this as a, a date, not a date necessarily, but a date in terms of how old Moses is. And then we can go um, forwards and backwards in history and kind of plug in some stuff here. So Moses' life, I think we would say, is kind of divided into three segments. Uh, growing up in Egypt from birth till the age of 40. 
living in exile in the land of Midian, where he works as a shepherd. That would be from the ages of uh, 40 up to 80. And then finally, leading God's people out of Egypt into the promised land. And that would be from the age of 80 until he dies at the age of 120. So 40, 40, and 40. And this is where we learn that Aaron is older. And I don't know whether we think of this too often, uh, but uh, Aaron is Moses' older brother. And in my mind, for some reason, sometimes I kind of have to think about this. I, in my mind, at least, it, it's easy for me to think of Moses as being the oldest, since he's the leader. Uh, but I just want us to notice here that is not the case. Aaron is actually three years older than Moses. And maybe you're thinking, well, of course, we, we already knew that. And I know I know that from reading the text, but in my mind, I just I keep on thinking of Moses being the oldest because he's kind of taking on this leadership role. But that's not the case. Um, we have Miriam actually born first. She's a few years older than uh, Aaron and Moses. And if you remember, why we know that is Miriam played a role in watching over Moses when he was in the river. And then she also played a role in communicating with Pharaoh's daughter and arranging for her own mother to provide for Moses as a baby. So uh, Miriam is really probably not a, even a teenager. I'm thinking maybe eight or nine years old, perhaps, when Moses is born. I don't think we're told that. But she's a little girl, but not quite an adult, so somewhere in the middle there. So it's Miriam and then Aaron and then uh, Moses as the youngest. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. The next paragraph here, Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. For each one threw down his staff, and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. So I think we now have the second appearance before Pharaoh, I believe, if I've calculated that correctly. And um, God has prepared them for this. God knows that Pharaoh will demand a sign. And when he does, Moses is to have Aaron throw the staff down, and it will turn into a serpent. And again, in my mind, this is kind of another one of those surprises to me. I always thought it was Moses' staff. Uh, but here, it seems pretty clear that this is Aaron's staff. So Aaron throws his staff down, and uh, that's what they do. Um, but Pharaoh, instead of being convinced, he looks around. He has his wise men, his magicians come in, his sorcerers, and they replicate this. Um, some have suggested that they use some kind of snake tranquilizer. They inject the snake with some drug, some kind of snake-paralyzing potion. Uh, maybe. Uh, that might have been it. We're not told. I don't know. Um, these men are described as being sorcerers, magicians with secret arts. So it, it might have uh, been science of some kind, some substance or some method that they used. And I think I, I would lean in that direction. Uh, but I'm, I'm at least open to the possibility that there might have been more to this, that there's a remote chance there might have been some supernatural aspect to this. I'm not sure. Uh, if you have some strong feelings about this, if there's something that I've missed on this, with, which is a, a possibility, um, I would love to hear about it. If you have some uh, understanding of this passage that I don't, whether this was a miraculous uh, reenacting of the miracle, whether this was some scientific thing that we're just not in on, uh, let me know what you think about that. Uh, I, I would love to hear about it. Um, because there's more of this kind of thing coming up over some of the um, uh, plagues and miracles that are coming here in the near future. Uh, we do have some evidence from the ancient world that the Egyptians were known for snake handling. And apparently even today there are some snakes out there that uh, will stiffen up like a, like a rod, like a, uh, like a walking stick. If you rub them in a certain way on the back of their head or, or something uh, to that effect. Um, how they do it though... It's not really the main point of this passage, is it? Otherwise, God would have told us how they did it. 
but he didn't tell us. Therefore, we really don't need to spend too much mental energy thinking about that. Uh, but it seems the main point here is that um, Moses and Aaron's snake eats their snakes. <laughs> so uh, God is prevailing here. You know, whatever you can do, I can do better. And brings it up another notch here. But even with this, um, notice Pharaoh's heart was hardened. You know, he, he sees his magicians do the staff to snake trick. He sees the Egyptian snakes get eaten by uh, Moses and Aaron's snake or staff. And he's still not convinced. You would think if, if I were there, I surely would have believed. Um, but Pharaoh is not convinced. Remember, his heart is in the process of being hardened. So he knows what he wants. He knows what he's not going to do. No matter what, I'm not going to let the people go. And I'm not going to listen to what Moses and Aaron have to say, just as the Lord had predicted. So he sees this amazing thing take place right there in front of his eyes, and he kind of doesn't care. He's not convinced by it. And notice in the New American Standard Bible, at least, it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It doesn't say that he hardened his own heart. It doesn't say that God hardened his heart. But his heart was simply hardened. He's not yielding to God's command to let the people go. And God will use him even against his will. God will be glorified with or without us. And um, it's much better um, that God uses us with our permission. I think that'd be a safe thing to say here. So get on board. It's much better to be on God's side than it is to be out there on our own working against God. Because God is going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish with or without us. I'm kind of thinking of that passage in 2 Thessalonians 2 where Paul describes somebody whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. So that's Second Thessalonians chapter 2, if you want to look into that a little bit more. So that's another difficult passage. I look at that, God, yes, sent a deluding influence, but only because the people had already decided to reject the truth. That deluding influence will simply make it more obvious so that others don't get sucked into that way of thinking. It's just uh, getting further and further out there. Um, by the way, let's not forget that God has already used the staff-to-snake miracle, hasn't he? Wasn't it back at the burning bush? God used that as a way of convincing Moses, and basically you'll see this again, and here it is. And, uh, of course, that convinced Moses back then. Sometimes the same message or the same sign, it may convince one person, while somebody else who hears or sees the exact same thing may be completely unconvinced, may be completely unmoved by it. And I think we see that today. The gospel message is preached. Some people say, wow, that's what I need to do. And other people will say, that's the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Uh, a bunch of superstitious weirdos, and they'll turn away from it. And so sometimes the gospel will convince some people, and it will only turn others further away from the truth. That's not the gospel's fault. That's up to us to accept it or reject it. And I think that's pretty much what we see here. Moses ultimately obeys. But Pharaoh does not. And uh, remember, both of them, both Moses and Pharaoh, saw the same sign. Uh, Moses had a soft heart, and Pharaoh did not. So let's continue tonight with Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 20. Exodus 7, 14 through 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water, and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile, and you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand, and it will be turned to blood. The fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will become foul, and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, and over their pools, and over all their reservoirs of water, that they may become blood. And there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. 
Well, I hope we caught God's assessment up there in verse 14, where he says that Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. So this, of course, puts it squarely on Pharaoh. God is not causing Pharaoh not to listen. God is not overriding miraculously Pharaoh's freedom of choice. This is on Pharaoh. This is not on God. And so God's going to try something else. Not that it'll change Pharaoh's mind necessarily, but there are other missions to accomplish here, as we alluded to earlier. So the next sign will involve something new, something unique. And it won't happen in the palace, won't happen in the throne room exclusively. But Moses is to catch Pharaoh somewhere kind of off guard. So he's, he's to meet Pharaoh uh, out on the bank of the Nile River as Pharaoh is heading out to the water. So there's some speculation. Why is this? This is a regular thing, a one-time thing. It seems to be a regular occurrence. Maybe he's going out to bathe. Uh, maybe he's going out to worship. Remember, they worship the god of the Nile and hundreds, if not thousands, of other gods. So it could have been worship, could have been to get drinking water, uh, could have been to bathe, could have been to supervise some project. We're not told. But Moses, when he meets Pharaoh by the Nile, is to repeat this demand, to let God's people go. And then he is to use the staff to strike the Nile River, he and Aaron. And the water in the Nile will be turned into blood, causing the fish to die and these other things that are supposed to happen. Well, we need to think about the importance of the Nile River to the land of Egypt. Um, Egypt is the Nile, isn't it? I mean, they depended on the Nile River for everything, for transport, uh, for commerce, for their crops to grow, um, for drinking water, for bathing, all of that. I think most of us learned about this when we were little, didn't we? I mean, like fifth or sixth grade, middle school, at least high school, probably already knew it by then, but the importance of the Nile River to the nation of Egypt. Um, the, the Nile would flood every year, replenishing the land, the silt would spread out, and the nutrients would come in, making crops possible in, in what was just an incredibly dry land. Um, Egypt, of course, even today, basically desert, isn't it? But the Nile River brought life to the nation. I mean, they had a god associated with the Nile River. All of their cities were up and down the Nile River. And if you were to take out a map and just look at a map, Egypt is the Nile River. I mean, where there is no Nile, there is no Egypt. They are tied together. And so Moses and Aaron then are to go big, aren't they? Right here at the beginning. And they are to attack the lifeblood of the nation, so to speak. They are to do it by using the staff that had been turned into a serpent and back again. And the point of doing this in verse 17 is so that Pharaoh and the people of Egypt would know that God is the Lord, that he is Yahweh. And this would affect, notice, not just the Nile River itself, but it would affect the streams and the pools and all of their other reservoirs. Everything would turn to blood. There would be blood everywhere, uh, including water that was held in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. So let's conclude tonight with Exodus 7, verses uh, 20 through 25. Exodus 7, 20 through 25. So Moses and Aaron did, even as the Lord had commanded. And he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile became foul, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was through all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the Nile. Seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. This is now the first of what we would refer to as being the ten plagues. But notice, this is not the first sign performed by God through Moses, is it? This is just the first one that qualifies as a plague. Um, the snake and the staff thing, that's not really a plague on the nation. That was kind of an individual personal sign for Pharaoh and his uh, magicians. But this is the first one that is... Uh, I, th I think qualifies as a plague here. I know some Bibles may label these with a little heading, you know, plague number one, plague number two, and so on. Others do not. Uh, most of my Bibles do not have those labels. So if yours does not, I, I might invite you or encourage you to put a note in the margin 
that uh, reads plague number one, and in my mind that kind of helps me remember what's there. If you believe in writing in your Bible, which I think is a generally a good idea, uh, Moses and Aaron obey. They strike the Nile with a staff. Everybody is gathered around. The Nile is turned to blood. So the fish die. The water turns foul. They can no longer drink from it. And this is widespread. So this is not just within the sight of the people right here. This is throughout the land of Egypt. Anything connected to the Nile uh, turns to blood. And I find it interesting that the magicians, they also duplicate this one, don't they? But I'm kind of wondering, how do they duplicate it if all the water is now blood? So I'm kind of thinking what they did, obviously, was on a much smaller scale. Uh, somebody whips out a bowl of water, <laughs> something like that. Uh, later on in here, we learn that they were digging by the Nile to find water to drink, so perhaps the water that was under the ground had not been turned to blood. So maybe they dig up some fresh water, they find it, and they do something that causes it to turn to blood, or at least to look like blood. Um, and again, going back to that previous discussion, whether what they did was some scientific trick, or whether there was some supernatural, beyond nature kind of power going on, we are not really told. But the bottom line is, Pharaoh is now unimpressed by what Moses and Aaron have done. His heart is hardened, and he just goes back to the palace with no concern for this. The nation has no water. Can you imagine that? Imagine right now that every source of water around us is undrinkable. That is a huge crisis, but notice what Pharaoh does. He goes home. He doesn't care. His heart is completely unmoved by this. So it's a huge crisis. Pharaoh is not thinking clearly. He's hardening his heart. He's making this decision not to do what God wants him to do. So he's stubborn. And this goes on for seven days. I mean, any smart person would have called Moses in and say, hey, how can we resolve this thing? Um, but Pharaoh is not one to do something like that, at least quite yet. So this brings us to where we hope to pick up next week. Next week, we plan on moving into Exodus 8 with the second of the ten plagues. Uh, as we close tonight, I want to make sure we don't miss something. I might have referred to it in passing a few times tonight, but the plagues of Egypt are really attacking the so-called gods of Egypt. And you can't see this in my notes. I have gods with a little g in quotes. So so-called gods. These plagues are designed to plague the gods of Egypt. And uh, I say this based on a brief statement over in Exodus chapter 12. If you want to look into this more, it's Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. So as he is explaining the final plague, so we're not there yet, we're heading in that direction, but as he explains that last plague, God says, Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And so I want us to notice there, we'll get back to this in a few weeks, but the plagues of Egypt were not primarily against the Egyptian people. God did not have an issue with the Egyptian people in particular. The plagues were aimed at demonstrating God's power over the gods of Egypt, the false gods of Egypt. You know, this is so far removed from us, uh, time-wise, also uh, culturally, I don't think we necessarily need to look at each of the Egyptian gods that are attacked here along with their names and so on. I mean, there's so much that's been written on this and, you know, pictures and uh, sculptures and paintings of these various gods. I mean, we could we could do that if we wanted to. Uh, but we could literally be in this these chapters for months if uh, if that was our choice. But I hope that we just note that for each of these plagues, God is demonstrating his power over at least one or more of those Egyptian gods. Um, the snake god, the god of the Nile, and so on. Do you remember some of the um, like face coverings on the coffins? I, I'm sure I'm not getting the name of all of that right, but I think most of us have seen kind of uh, the carvings uh, on top of those coffins from ancient Egypt. Have you seen those with the the snake kind of coming out of a, the forehead like a like a cobra ready to strike. You know, Pharaoh himself was considered to be a god by many people. And the snake was a huge part of that, kind of representative of that. Well, this whole thing with the staff and the snake, that was a direct assault on that idea. And the same would go for the Nile River, the god of the Nile providing life and 
and so on. That, that was a direct assault on that God showing that the one true God has power over all of those other gods. Well, in terms of our schedule, uh, next week is what we traditionally refer to as being cardio night. Uh, the night we would normally move the boxes of clothing upstairs for the clothing giveaway to get ready to more quickly uh, deploy those on Saturday. And that's coming up. Uh, the clothing giveaway is a week and a half from tonight, which makes cardio night next Wednesday evening. Um, so we haven't discussed this. I'm assuming we may be meeting in person uh, at the church building next Wednesday evening. Um, we may do class live like we would on a Sunday morning. We may just watch the video together like we did last year, and then you know, we can sing and pray together for a little bit there. I'm not sure exactly what we'll do a week from tonight. Uh, some of that depends on the tech part of it and who's available to help with all that. But uh, we hope to announce that on Sunday. So I guess I'm saying stay tuned for next Wednesday evening. We should be here on YouTube, uh, but as for in person, we might be able to meet together at the building uh, next Wednesday to uh, help get that stuff upstairs so we can serve the community uh, in a better way. Uh, speaking of this coming Sunday, John Higgins will be guiding us through the second half of 3rd John. I've enjoyed these studies. And then during the worship assembly, we're planning on having our special emphasis on faith by uh, arranging our thoughts around a series of songs and scripture readings. And uh, we normally do that on the fifth Sunday, which was this past Sunday, but we move that to the first Sunday in August. We can be flexible like that. And uh, that'll get us ready then to move into Hebrews chapter 11, the following Lord's Day, if, if the Lord wills. But I hope to see most of you this coming Lord's Day morning. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, something we need to be praying about, um, let me know. Use the information that should be on your screen. If you're joining us on the phone, text me or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for letting us study your inspired word tonight. We're thankful for your servant Moses and for his courage in doing whatever it was that you told him to do, even though it was very difficult for him. We know, Father, that doing what you've told us to do is never truly risky, for we know that you are a God who knows what's best for us. And you've promised to take care of us. We pray for hearts that trust you. And we pray for honest hearts, always willing to do what's right. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.